Hey, I'm Kelly Hogan. Listen, I want to talk to you about something that's been on my mind for a while. There are lots of ways to lose 100 pounds. And I know so many of you have written to say, oh my gosh, I need to lose 100 pounds. So one of those ways, for example, you could eat nothing but cabbage soup all day and you would eventually lose weight. I mean, you're going to miss out on a lot of nutrients and you probably won't stick to it for long and you're probably going to have some gastrointestinal distress. But through the years, thousands of people have tried the cabbage soup diet. And some people even lost weight. Then they quit because who can live that way, right? Or you could just eat fewer and fewer and fewer calories and move your body more and more and more. But how did that work for most of us the first 300 times that we tried it? And even if you are already pretty sure that you know the absolute best way to lose weight, knowing it and actually doing it are not even related, right? So after working with people, a lot of people, over the past 19 years of my own weight loss journey, I realized that it really comes down to four main changes that can help us to drop weight and keep it off forever and get off of this yo-yoing. Now, I'll warn you, some of these tips are going to sound boring or cheesy or even really familiar, and that's because, well, because they work. The first thing to do is to get your head right. And if you truly think you cannot lose weight, you are likely right. If you think you're too weak or too unmotivated, then yes, you are probably right. Because every single thought that we have truly matters. And if you think that it cannot happen, then your negative self-limiting thoughts will likely prevent your progress from happening for very long. And we end up self-sabotaging and I know saying affirmations feel very annoying to me because it feels like I'm just sitting here lying to myself. But what we're trying to do is rewire our brain to be who we want to be. So if you were to say a positive affirmation like this five times throughout the day, you would start to behave differently. Even if you feel like an idiot while you say it. <laughs> saying things like, I can do hard things. This time is different. Small changes will make a big difference. My health is important and I want this and I respect myself enough not to quit. Saying your own affirmations throughout the day, reading them if you need to, it's going to feel fake and it's going to feel forced and silly for a while. And frankly, that's okay. The next thing I would encourage you to do is just take one minute of your day to sit alone in a quiet room with your eyes closed. You can actually do this a few times throughout the day, but let's just start with one minute per day. Just close your eyes and breathe. Focus on making the breath deep all the way down into your belly, through your nose, if possible. I want you to literally feel your butt sitting on your chair. I want you to feel your feet touching the ground. This will help shut off this autopilot mode and it's going to awaken your prefrontal cortex. And this is like the best part of your brain. It controls your reasoning, your problem solving, your impulse control, perseverance, creativity. This part of the brain is huge. It's beautiful. That's the part of the brain that we want to be active. And shutting ourselves off from all other stimulus can actually activate this part of the brain. And brain scans have proven that. Now, with our eyes closed, try to list some things that you're grateful for, even though that's going to feel very hokey. But there's solid research that making yourself list the things that you're grateful for each day can literally, it's been proven to lower blood pressure, increase the activity in that prefrontal cortex. It leads to higher self-esteem, increased happiness, and motivation. So list maybe five things that you already have, that you're glad to have, that you would be quite sad to have without. Maybe you've got nice kids or a dog, another day to live. Maybe you've got steak in the fridge, a warm cup of coffee. Maybe you have nice eyebrows. I don't know, whatever you're glad to have. Just take a quick moment and reflect on the ways that you are already winning. You are already blessed. And if you cannot find anything, you are not looking hard enough. The more time you spend looking for those things, the better you're going to get at finding them. And then take one more moment to visualize 
exactly how you want to be. If you want to be more ripped, see it in your head. Um, not someone else being ripped, but you. See yourself, your face, you. If you want to lose weight, see yourself as thinner. If you want to be a faster runner, imagine it. Feel the details. See the clothes that you would wear. Imagine feeling completely free from sugar addiction and not caring about sweets whatsoever. Imagine, imagine enjoying the steak and saying no to the fries. Imagine putting on walking shoes and choosing to get up and go for a walk and enjoying it. Imagine drinking cold water, just a glass of water and enjoying that. Taste it, feel it, picture your face, picture yourself as the person in this detailed image. And doing that is not going to alter the universe or change the people around you. That I'm not into the new age voodoo of that, okay, people? <laughs> what this will do is allow your brain to see and feel and experience what it is that you want. It opens your mind up to the possibilities and makes it feel like a safer and more likely option than some scary unknown. And your own body starts to believe these images and your desires will actually change. You may find that you suddenly feel like taking a walk or drinking the water. Also, forcing yourself to just sit quietly without any external stimulation will help you to build up some emotional maturity without having a screen to keep us entertained for just even one whole minute. And you may be surprised at how challenging it is I was. But the fact that it's hard is actually good. It helps us to build up some resilience, and that is important. Doing even a small, challenging task will help us to become more resilient. We can do that through hard things like exercise, cold showers, meditation, or even just trying to make it through a book. Um, Best-selling author Sarah Wilson, she uses the mantra, stay longer. She says that staying in the moment when things are hard, it keeps us in the moment and helps us to be more resilient against other hard things later, like saying no to dessert. And yes, I am still talking about just the mental part because that's that's huge. After we get this part right, the other three tips are going to be pretty easy, but the other three are useless if we haven't worked on our head first. So let's keep at step one first just a little longer. Hang with me. All of us have core beliefs about ourselves. They usually stem from things that happened to us back in our childhood. So for example, if we have a core belief about ourselves, something like, I am always going to be fat. It's who I am. Or I don't have any motivation. I'm just lazy. And what we have these beliefs, our brain looks at the world and tries to find supporting evidence all day long. So when you do make yourself go exercise, you're focused on the negatives and your brain is looking to prove that your self-limiting beliefs are right. Things like, oh, I got sweat in my eyes and my leg is cramping and there are gnats. I really do hate exercise. I knew I hated exercise. And the brain is so good at doing this that you'll even write off the positive moments as just being a fluke. So if you truly do believe that you're worthless, you're going to find all supporting evidence to support it. And you will even block out compliments from people just because it's contrary to your core beliefs. So how can you change core belief? Well, it may help to, to think about where did it even come from? Did your grandma tell you you were lazy? Did a kid at school call you fatty? That definitely happened to me. But we, we should do the uncomfortable task of looking at some of these painful memories to see why we think we're not worthy of taking good care of ourselves. Why do we continue to self-sabotage? What belief is it supporting? Why do you think you're never going to lose weight? And when we do look back, look back as if you are the kind and loving parent now. Sarah Wilson also says, look back and parent yourself. So if you did have kind of crappy parents. You may have to parent yourself even better than they did, but tell yourself that that kid at school was, was just trying to be hurtful. He was wrong about lots of things. Remember that kid? He was wrong about a lot, including you. He wasn't a prophet. He was just some little punk kid at school who was probably hurting as well. His words are completely meaningless now. You don't have to let his words hold any power over you anymore. 
So tell your little girl self or your little boy self, you were adorable because you were. And I didn't see myself as that either. In fact, looking at pictures of myself as a child has always been kind of painful. And I've always thought, oh, so not, not cute. But frankly, yes, I was. I was a sweetheart. I was precious. I need to have some talks with that little one who was so hurt. And the people that hurt me when I was little were likely just other hurting humans. And they were wrong. And we have the right to be angry about it. But we can also see them as hurting people who failed to protect us. And we can even work on forgiving the adults that failed to protect us and forgive them for inflicting even more hurt as well. And thinking through some of our past childhood hurts and traumas, even little t traumas, can help us to see ourselves as the survivor that we are. We have been through some hard stuff and we're still here. That's amazing. We're still here fighting for ourselves and loving on people. You are worthy of love. You are able to change. You are strong and you are empowered. You have so much under your control. Every single bite you take, every step that you take on a walk, it is within your control. And once you start to see yourself as precious and empowered and capable, you are much more likely to start making changes. You're going to start to expect other people to respect your food choices. You're going to start to have more self-respect to keep promises to yourself. When you say, I'm going to do this, you respect yourself enough to carry through and not lie to yourself. You're going to care enough about your inner self and your body to make healthy food choices. And once you work through some of those hurts, you may find that you don't need that addictive processed food as a source of comfort and you won't need them as like your daily therapy every night. So every day, I encourage you to find a way to gently and wisely parent that little girl or little boy inside your head that lived through some of these difficult times. Tell them what you would tell your own son or daughter if they were living through those same hurts. Remind yourself that you have survived. You are the hero of this story. You may not have been perfect, but you don't have to continue feeling guilt and shame for long gone mistakes you are now in this moment and we are moving forward to a brighter future and to get yourself better at being present practice closing your eyes and concentrating on those slow breaths through your nose fire up that prefrontal cortex and this is all so that we can break through our thought habits and stop living these same thoughts and same habits day in and day out. They keep us going back to these foods that hurt us and keep us from our life goals. We're seeking comfort from the very foods that are hurting us instead of going to the true source of comfort, our creator, through prayer, through other humans who are blessed now to have into our lives, through foods that can actually nourish our bodies, through sleep, which can actually help restore us. And to let go of those old thought processes, we have to get out of this default mode or like autopilot. If, if those are the behaviors and foods that we're so used to turning to, it just becomes autopilot, but it's not who we really want to be. But please know that your brain is going to resist breaking with autopilot mode. Um, it's going to take a little more energy. We're going to have to be really purposeful. You might even feel emotional as you try to change these old behaviors that have just become like effortless ritual and habit. And we have to forgive ourselves for having those bad habits. Even if your habit was you were eating 700 Little Debbies per week, there was a positive intention behind it. You were likely just trying to make yourself feel better. And even though those processed foods were releasing all kinds of happy chemicals into your brain that made it really addictive, in the moment, it likely did make you feel better just for a moment. And it wasn't serving you in the long run, but in the short run, it made you feel better for a moment. So let's let go of the guilt. You were just trying to feel better. We don't have to shame ourselves for that. For We don't need to shame ourselves for turning back to that drug of choice repeatedly. Those foods were just designed to light up the limbic reward system and to keep us addicted. They were designed that way. So you were self-soothing and those processed foods just kept us coming back for more as they were designed to do. 
So instead of shaming yourself, ask yourself, was the behavior a problem for you? Was there anything wrong with eating all of that sugar and processed foods? Well, for me, it was a problem. It caused me to crave more and more and more sugar. Also, I had boils. I weighed 262 pounds. And that behavior just was not working for me. Um, it didn't work for me to try a low-fat diet or a plant-based diet. I tried all of those things. And if those things work for you, that's fine. But if eating all of this sugar is not helping your life to improve, there's a reason to change. Be very aware of why it didn't work and why you need to make the changes. No need to shame yourself for not doing it sooner. Just let go of that. Just keep reminding yourself of why you need the change now. What pain did those foods and behaviors cause you? Humans hate pain. As long as you very firmly understand that it's causing you pain, long-term issues, your body will work to avoid that going forward. And we can keep building up resilience and engaging that prefrontal cortex by visualizing, by clearing our mind of these old thoughts and focus instead on why we need the change, how it's going to look, how it's going to feel once we make those changes. Right. And that brings me to the next little exercise to try. Write out a journal entry as if you have already made the changes. This is a future self exercise, future self. So this healthy, happy, unaddicted version of yourself. If it were me, I would. you could write out something like, Dear Kelly, I'm feeling so good these days. I don't even miss the carbs. I eat steak. I take walks. I feel so much more energetic each day. I had to buy some smaller pants again, and I can't believe how good I feel. I have this mental clarity and feeling of freedom, and I love knowing when I'm hungry and that I can just eat a steak and feel fueled. Seeing food as fuel has been such a wonderful life change. And it's good to finally feel happy and healthy. So you would write out a journal entry or 10, something like that. And your brain and actually, your brain and your body actually start to like buy into it. Especially if you take time to really visualize that and to feel it like in your soul. And then start making a daily promise to yourself. I don't know if you've heard of Dr. Nicole DePera. But she says that she did this back when she had hit rock bottom and she didn't know how to start with anything big. So she just promised herself, I'm going to sit up straight and tall and I'm going to take five deep breaths every day. And that was it. That was her promise to herself. She literally did not feel that she had the capacity to promise herself much more than that. But then she kept her promise. She, she started by sitting up tall. She took her five deep breaths every day. And that was it. Promise kept. And by keeping a small, healthy promise to yourself, you're going to build up some credibility. You're building trust with your own self. So start with a new small thing that you know that you can do forever. Maybe promise yourself that you're going to make the bed every day or that you will do just five push-ups, or that you'll go outside and breathe deeply and get a little sunlight on your face and your eyes for one minute per day. Or that you will close your eyes for one minute each day with no external stimulation to just breathe and clear your head. But then the key is, do it. You don't have to overwhelm yourself with something huge unless you just truly feel ready to do it. Starting at your level, where you are right now, make it something doable. A change that you feel would be positive, but also doable for you. So reflect. What would that be? What is your next positive step forward that feels doable for you right now? Once you've started doing some of these mental exercises, like you've repeatedly visualized what you want, you've practiced clearing your head, you've journaled it out as your future healthy self. Maybe you've worked through some of these childhood memories that help to create these core beliefs about yourself that may not even actually be true. We've questioned, questioned them and worked through them. You have prepared the canvas. Your resilience will start to improve. Your self-esteem will start to go up. You've built some trust with yourself. 
you've built a stronger prefrontal cortex that's going to be more active. You're going to have a more optimistic outlook on the future because you've literally started rewiring your own brain to accept the changes that are to come. And now, if you feel ready for that, we're going to go on to step two on how to lose a lot of weight and keep it off forever. Step two is the food. So we have to eat. We need nutrients to keep our body functioning well. This is a given. But if you're triggered to binge when you eat pastas and sweets, starches, processed carbohydrates, you are not alone. Those foods override our satiety signals and they cause us to overeat. They also give us a lot of calories with very little nutrition. And many of them are full of chemicals and fillers that are so hard on our gut lining. So if we're going to lose weight, what can we eat? For me, my doctor, 19 years ago, he told me, eat meat, eggs, a little dairy, and very low-carb vegetables, if I wanted them. And that's what I did. In order to lose most of the 130 pounds that I've lost. Well, I didn't like vegetables very much. So I didn't eat a lot of them. I mostly ate meat, but with some pickles, green beans, a salad here and there with full fat salad dressing. And over time, I started to realize that I felt my absolute best when I only ate the meat and the eggs. So I haven't eaten plants other than like seasonings on my meat. And I still drink coffee since 2009. That's what I've done. And that's what works for me. But you may find that something else works for you. So my suggestion is this. First, try a very low-carb diet. If you can cut out all of the sugary drinks, the soda, the sweetened tea, and get your carbs down to around 40 total carbs per day, not per meal, you will likely start to lose weight eating that way. In fact, many people also feel less inflamed just cutting their carbs down to 40 or fewer carbs per day. And that may work beautifully for you forever. Uh, I did 20 carbs or less for about five years, and I managed to lose a lot of weight doing that. It worked pretty well, but it was also really hard. And why? Well, I'm not good at moderating carbs, so it would be like putting a severe alcoholic on a regimen of drink two sips of alcohol per day just two sips and that seems fair right you can have two sips per day what's the problem well the problem is that alcoholics aren't good at moderate moderating alcohol so many of us are not good at moderating carbohydrates and sugars that was me for me i found that eating none was so much easier than just having a little and once i removed all sweet tastes and all carby foods from my diet it actually got easier to stick to. In fact, I lost my sweet tooth completely and I began to actually crave real food. Meats. I didn't crave meat until I abstained from carbs and sugars in the exact same way that a true alcoholic would have to abstain from all tastes of alcohol. I have to obtain from all tastes of sweet. But that doesn't mean that you will necessarily have to live that way. There are people who can moderate alcohol effortlessly. There are some people who can moderate carbs. And if you're the type that can eat one or two cookies, put them away, forget about them, maybe you aren't a sugar addict. But that was never the case with me. <laughs> if they were in the house, I was constantly thinking about them and fighting to not eat all of them. So let's say that you decide you do have a problem with processed foods, sugars, carbohydrates. You realize, oh my gosh, I need to be an abstainer too. I'm not a moderator. Then I suggest that you get it out of your environment as much as possible. Begin the detox process. And you're going to need some of that resilience because the first couple of weeks might be hard. And what can help you get through it? Well, in my experience, staying full of real food real food. So for me, that meant eating a large fatty steak two to three times every day, or having a large bowl of soft scrambled eggs when a craving would hit, or eating a whole plate of bacon. Eating plenty 
of nutrient-dense animal products will help your body to stay satisfied and will help prevent the cravings for those addictive foods that you just can't moderate. And once you cut out the carbs, or at least most of the carbs, you might feel worse for a little while. Sometimes things get worse before they get better. Imagine like uh, you're remodeling a kitchen. It's going to get worse before it gets better. And it can be really helpful to know that up front, to expect it that it takes some time for your body to adapt to getting energy from the fatty meats instead of energy from the carbs. So your body will become a fat-fueled machine eventually, but that conversion process can take a minute. You may have some upset stomach because you might have low stomach acid and you're just not used to digesting that much meat. You may need to take some electrolytes during that time. I didn't, but some people do. Um, some people even need to try HCL, or some ox bile supplements for a little while. Other people just adapt easily. They take right to it. If you have constipation issues, you may need to drink a little more water, eat meats with a little more fat, chew a little more thoroughly, eat a little slower. You may want to add a little more butter to your meals for a while. If you're having the opposite problem, things are coming out just a little too quickly. You could try cutting back on the fat for a little bit. Again, chew really well, allow the saliva, which has the acids, which will help break down your food. Give it time for that to work in your mouth before you even swallow it. You could also try eating smaller meals throughout the day and work up to the larger meals of fattier meats if upset stomach is your issue. It usually doesn't take long for people to start to feel better and to see a drop on the scale especially if you were eating a whole lot of carbs right before you started this. And those positive results that you're going to experience are so motivating, and they're going to lead you to want even more positive changes. It's this snowball effect of, oh my gosh, I feel better. I'm looking better. <gasps> I want more of that. And once you become used to eating this really low-carb diet, and you're pretty easily keeping your carbs at or below 40 per day, then you can decide if you need to make further adjustments. So if you aren't having to fight cravings all day, you may be able to keep in the diet soda or some sweeteners in your diet. I, I don't think they're best, but some people can keep them in and not have the intense cravings. But if you are having cravings all day, you might want to consider cutting out all of the sweeteners and sweet tastes. Also, if you're still having joint inflammation, um, upset stomach, or your insulin just won't come down, Sometimes sweeteners are to blame. And if the person just tries cutting them out, even for say 30, 60 days, then they can start to feel less inflammation. The cravings go away, the freedom sets in, they start to crave real food, they get better glucose readings. And sometimes that takes care of the upset stomach as well. If you are doing low carb and you still have issues with inflammation, like the joint pain, or some gut issues, autoimmune flare-ups, you can try removing all plants from your diet to see if that helps. You literally can get all of the essential vitamins, nutrients, amino acids from just animal products. So there's no need to worry about not getting enough carbs. Humans have no minimum requirements for carbohydrates. We can live off of only animal products forever without even a supplement requirement. But that doesn't mean that everyone has to do it that way. If you feel great and you are getting great results while eating animal products plus avocados, you could do that. And if you can eat meats and still have some pickles or olives without having any belly pains or carb cravings, weight gain or inflammation, I think that sounds perfect. What more could I want for you? The idea is that you find a diet that removes these junky and addictive processed foods while still providing your body with excellent nutrition in a way that is able to keep you full and satisfied. Bonus points if your diet also doesn't cause you to have intense cravings or gastric distress. And if your diet also allows you to lose weight, have good energy, sleep well, keeps your libido up, makes your nails and your hair grow, keeps your moods pretty even and happy. Oh, that's fantastic. All right, so once you think you know what that diet might be, I would encourage you to try like a 30-day experiment with that diet. Write down 
say five breakfasts that fit into this new diet that you plan to try. Write down five possible lunches that apply to this diet and five healthy dinner ideas and five healthy snack ideas. So for me, that would look something like this. Okay, I know that carnivore works best for my body. So for breakfast, I could have scrambled eggs with bacon or a meaty, cheesy omelet, a sausage sandwich, but instead of bread, use sausage patties for the bread with some eggs and cheese between, maybe um, an eggy baked casserole with meat and cheese or a steak. Yep, steak for breakfast, because there are no rules here, people. <laughs> For lunch, well, I usually eat some ground meat from the air fryer, burger patties. Um, you could even do fast food burger patties, strips of steak, chicken wings, a pack of smoked salmon, a bunch of cooked bacon, some deli meats, hard-boiled eggs, or a rotisserie chicken. And for dinner, I usually have a steak, pork chops, ribs. I eat a lot of chicken thighs more burger patties, but very often it's a steak with plenty of fat on it, and I eat until I'm comfortably full. I don't go hungry, but I also don't try to overstuff myself most of the time. Sometimes that happens. It's okay. For the most part, I prefer to feel full, but not like Thanksgiving stuffed miserable. Okay, for snacks, uh, you probably won't need to do a lot of snacking because hopefully you're going to be so full from these big meaty meals. But if you do find yourself wanting a snack, you could eat some bacon, pork rinds, preferably not cooked in seed oils, pepperoni, carnivore snacks, carnivore crisps, hard-boiled eggs. Um, some of those things are a little bit easy to overeat. So I would try to limit snacking, focus on eating meals of real meats. But if it comes down to some pork rinds versus donuts in the break room, for heaven's sakes, eat the pork rinds. Um, I would try to avoid the ones with MSG, seed oils, sugars, sweeteners. But no matter what, it's going to be better than the donuts. And if you get hungry between meals frequently, I would just eat bigger meals. Or grab some meat and call it a between meal meat snack. Have a slice of bacon or five and just Go back to life and what you were doing. Once you start making these changes, you may begin to have some feelings of deprivation, but I would encourage you to reframe those negative thoughts. And think, if I eat pizza, I'm going to have to go through withdrawals again. I'll probably have a bellyache and gain some of this weight back, and I'm going to feel disappointed in myself, and I don't, I don't deserve that. What I deserve is to feel good. I... I kind of wish I could eat pizza like other people, but I would rather look and feel good. I would rather miss out on the pain and also just miss out on the pizza and eat some delicious food that makes me feel like a million bucks. I would rather not be addicted and I would rather lose weight and everybody struggles with something, but at least I know what I need to do in order to feel better. It's worth it and I am worth it. And your brain may not believe those thoughts at first. In fact, that thought may even make you a little bit mad and your brain may reject that new thought pattern. But the more you talk to yourself this way, the more your brain will start to accept this and will look for evidence to confirm it. So we can rehearse these new thought patterns. The joy of missing out on the junky processed food also gives us the JOMO, the joy of missing out on the pain and addiction that comes with it. And our brain will start to look for evidence to confirm these thoughts that you're practicing with yourself. And if you're doing all of that brain work while you're also fueling your body with plenty of fat and protein, you're going to start to see and feel results that will provide your body and your brain with positive feedback and confirmation that these thoughts must be true. It's working. Okay, so now we've covered steps one and two. Step one was the mental aspect. And step two was figuring out a diet plan that you want to try. And it may look a little different from mine, but you decide what you think is going to work best for your body. Step three to losing weight has to do with hormones. Weight loss is very much hormonal. Um, most bodies are very resistant to dropping excess weight if they're in a state of stress. Eating healthy foods and avoiding processed junk food, which is basically like poison, and giving up all that sugar is a great start 
to getting our hormone levels where they should be. But there are some other things that could help. So if your body is living in this constant state of stress and panic, you may not even realize it. You may just think that's how life is because you've gotten used to it. Uh, but maybe your hormones have not gotten used to it. So if you're dealing with stress, you may want to try to lower or normalize cortisol levels. Some ways to do that. Take the walk. Lots of walks. Long walks. Quick walks. <laughs> walks on your lunch break. Um, walk in the sun if possible. Listen to some music if you'd like. Talk to a friend while you walk. All of these things are wonderful for lowering cortisol and can help us to have happier hormones. Eating foods with plenty of healthy fats, including some omega-3s like you can find in fish, are great for cortisol levels. Finding ways to relax. You may have to literally schedule some time for this. Schedule time for your hobby. If you don't have a hobby, maybe get one. Find an activity that's not screen-based that you enjoy, like painting, paint my numbers, running, crafting, crosswords, writing, golf, shooting hoops, I don't know, reading books, crocheting, an activity that engages you but is also a nice release. Also, sleep. It is nearly impossible to normalize our cortisol levels and lower stress while we are sleep deprived. Um, it's also nearly impossible to lose weight while we have all that cortisol pumping through our veins. So let's get some rest, take the walks, enjoy a hobby, do some deep breathing, maybe try doing some exercise yoga, get some sun, talk to someone, have physical touch, pet your dog or cat. All of these things have literally been proven to help with cortisol. There's even evidence to show that going barefoot in the grass taking a cold shower, avoiding screens, and using more natural light, like through having an open window um, instead of all of this artificial light and blue light. All of those things are actually shown to help with cortisol levels as well. If there are stressors that you can remove or reduce, that's great. Maybe get rid of those things if you can. <laughs> but learning to deal with the stress is a very effective way when you can't quit the toxic job or just, you know, get a new family. <laughs> it's always a great idea to take moments throughout the day to breathe a word of thanks for the fact that you may be busy, but you are safe. Tell yourself that you're safe. Thank God that you're safe. Let your body be very aware that you're not in danger and that it is safe to rest, digest, and heal. Okay, the fourth and final tip to losing weight forever, to keeping this weight off forever, is to have some support. And you can try explaining what you're doing to the people in your life. They may or may not understand. But what you eat is your call only. You are the only one in charge of that. Every single bite you take, that is your control. So you make the decision and then allow other people to feel how they are going to feel. That's not your problem. That is their problem. But if your friends and family are not supportive in your new endeavors, research has shown that you're more likely to not stick with these changes. In fact, statistically, if you can have five positive interactions per day with people who are supportive of your path that you're on, you are more likely to stick to it. So if you are trying this low carb or carnivore route, um, every day visit some low carb or carnivore Facebook pages or Instagram stories, listen to podcasts, Follow people who are doing the same thing who would support you. Immerse yourself in their content and in their presence. Um, maybe reach out to people. I know that in my groups, I send them every single month Instagram accounts that they could follow and people who are willing to respond in the DMs. We have a Facebook group where I encourage them to post every single day if they need to. Have that accountability. If you're determined to do the carnivore diet like I do, you may wish to join a carnivore group. There are tons of support groups out there right now. I run groups, but so do plenty of other people. And I would just encourage you to find your people. So whether you're into fasting, which I'm not into water fasting, I love fat fasting and other metabolic resets, but not water fasting. Or if you're into running or keto, underwater basket weaving, whatever you're into, 
I'm telling you, there is a group out there for it. And they are going to help you stick with your goals just by finding those people and interacting with them. Preferably five interactions per day. That is what research says will help you to stick with those commitments and those goals. These people can also help you on the days when you aren't perfect because you likely won't be every single day. Perfection is not our only goal. We are striving for progress and for feeling better. And that may not always look like 100% perfection compliance. But a good support group can help you deal with the lapses. The, the times when you're in the ditch, the carb ditch, or you fell off the wagon, whatever you want to call it. And then we can also help each other to learn from those tough moments. A good group is going to encourage you to focus on how you feel afterwards and how to avoid those situations in the future if they affected you negatively and brought you pain. Remember, humans will work to avoid pain. So if you really do want to lose a large amount of weight and keep it off for the rest of your life, there are four main things to do. Let's quickly review. Number one, get your head right. Work through some of those past hurts that may have led you to some really flawed core beliefs about yourself. If you have serious trauma, you may need some actual therapy or to work with a professional. Work on some future self journaling. Learn to calm your mind with that meditation. Visualize yourself exactly how you want to be. And start practicing daily gratitude. Build up your prefrontal cortex um, and some resilience with some resilience activities and keep that daily small promise to yourself. Secondly, choose a diet. For me, that is all animal products. But whatever you choose, please make sure that it is high in nutrients. Hello, meats and eggs. Yes, that it should be free of addictive sugars and seed oils, junky fillers. The diet should be based on whole ingredients with plenty of healthy fats. Make sure it's something that you can see yourself enjoying and that it would work for your life and for your goals. For me, that is carnivore. And for you, that might be something a little different. But pick the plan that you think will work for you and then just write down some meal ideas that fit into that plan. Thirdly, I would work on balancing hormones by lowering your cortisol levels or normalizing them. Utilize sleep, sun, movement, hobbies, prayer, human contact, physical contact, deep breathing, cold showers, quiet time, and even laughter. Take time for your mental well-being because it really can affect your weight and health. And lastly, find your people. They might be YouTubers or coaches, friends, family, accountability partner at work, podcast that inspires you, a Facebook group with lots of good information, but having people in your corner to help celebrate your successes and to help you get back on track when you do mess up can make all the difference in the world. And if you can do those four things, I'm telling you, you'll almost certainly never have to worry about weight again. You can eat healthy foods and become resilient enough to turn down the foods that hurt your body. You can stay full of nutrient-dense foods and learn to love movement and see life as a happy gift instead of this constant battle of making yourself eat less and less and less while struggling to avoid binges due to being literally starving. Life does not have to be that way anymore. Humans, we are, we are created to be malleable, fluid creatures that can change. We can literally decide what we want to become and make it happen. I am incredibly different from the person I was in my 20s. I was emotional and obese, anxious, shy, addicted to sugar. And now I'm free from addiction. I'm more emotionally stable. I'm at a healthy weight. I'm happy. Your brain and your body are capable of remarkable changes if you're willing to put in the hard and sometimes cheesy work of making those changes possible. So thanks for joining me today. If you think any of these tips could help somebody else that you know, whether they're ready to be a carnivore or not, please share this video or at least post a comment of word of encouragement to somebody else to get the word to other people. All right, talk to you soon.